If you're a Corvette fan, you'll be well aware GM has just recently revealed the next generation Corvette. And you'll also know it's a mid-engine car. But what's the big deal with mid-engine? Why has GM made some of the Corvette fans unhappy by changing away from the time-honoured front-engine car? Stay tuned and I'll tell you why a mid-engine car outperforms a front-engine car. But as an alert, I'll warn you in advance, there are some physics and maths involved. But I'm afraid without that, I can't explain the facts. At the end of each point, and there are three of those, I will give you a simple statement to sum it up. OK, let's watch the video. Before we discuss the vehicle dynamics for the two cars, I need to briefly introduce two related concepts, inertia and weight transfer. A non-engineering definition of inertia is a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. In fact, you might even know a few people with inertia. A more engineering version or definition is the resistance of any object to change from its state of rest or uniform velocity unless acted upon by a force. Inertia is the tendency to resist the applied force. A good example of inertia is a person travelling on a bus. When the bus accelerates away from the bus stop, the person standing on the bus is jerked backwards. This is because of the resistance or inertia of their body to start moving. The bus accelerates forward, their body wants to stay, so their body feels like it's being thrown backwards. Everything is OK while the bus is travelling at a constant speed, but as soon as the bus breaks, the person's body wants to continue its forward motion. Their inertia or resistance to decelerating causes them to keep moving forward even though the bus is braking. The person needs to make a physical effort, perhaps by grabbing a pole to stay upright. Then if the bus rounds a corner, the passenger's body again wants to stay travelling in a straight line and resist the change, causing them to be thrown sideways by their inertia. One result of inertia that's applicable in vehicle dynamics is that of weight transfer. When a car is accelerated, braked or turned into a corner, its inertia causes a weight transfer. When a car is accelerating, its inertia throws a proportion of the car's weight back, the same as it did with the guy on the bus. What it does is transfer some of the weight from the front tyres of the car to the back tyres of the car. You might have seen drag cars that lift the front wheels right off the deck as they come off the start line. In this case, they've transferred all the weight from the front tyres to the back tyres. When a car brakes, the same thing happens in reverse. Weight is transferred from the rear tyres to the front tyres as inertia tries to keep pushing the car forward, again like the guy on the bus. You'll probably see a car dip down in the front under heavy braking as the extra weight transferred to the front compresses the front springs and the nose lowers. Weight transfer also happens when a car goes around a corner. Weight is transferred to the wheels on the outside of the corner from the wheels on the inside. You may have felt at some time in a car that the car that you're in may roll over because it's going round the corner so fast. The weight was being transferred to the tyres on the outside of the corner, threatening to roll the car over. You also need to know a little about friction. When you slide a block of wood over a piece of glass, it slides easier than if you slid it over a rough concrete. Friction is the force you need to apply to the block of wood to make it move. The friction force varies depending on the downward pressure you put on the block, and it also depends on the nature of the surface you're sliding it on. In fact, there's an equation that tells you how much effort it takes to start the block sliding. It takes the following form, F equals N by mu, where F is the force to move the block, N is the weight of the block, and mu is a number called the friction coefficient that takes into account the two surfaces that are contacting. From the formula, you can see the force to slide the block increases as the downward load on the block increases, and also increases as the coefficient of friction increases, or gets better. OK, that's enough to get us started. Let's look at why the mid-engine C8 will perform better than the front-engine C7. Point one is about straight-line acceleration. The fundamental difference between the C7 and C8 in terms of vehicle dynamics is the C7, which is a front-engine car, has approximately 50% of its weight on the rear tyres and 50% on the front tyres. 
the figure is more accurately 51% on the rear, but 50% is close enough and easier to do the calculations. On the other hand, the new C8 is a mid-engine car, and we're told by GM it has 60% of its weight on the rear tyres. Now, remembering that the force required to slip a car's tyre on the bitumen is proportional to the downward weight on that tyre, and the C8 has a higher percentage of its weight on the rear tyres, it will take more force on the C8's tyres to make them slip or spin. We are assuming that mu, the coefficient of friction, is the same between the respective tyres on the two cars. And the more force we can apply to the rear tyres, the higher the acceleration of the car. This means the mid-engine C8 will accelerate faster than the front-engine C7. I should mention here we're assuming total weight, wheelbase and centre of gravity height are similar between the two Corvettes. So to sum up, the mid-engine car will accelerate harder than the front-engine car in a straight line because it has more weight on the rear wheels and hence more traction. My point too is that the mid-engine car will have better out-of-corner acceleration. As I described earlier, when a car goes around a corner, it undergoes a weight transfer from the inside tyres to the outside tyres due to inertia, the same way the guy on the bus experiences. He will experience a higher load on his leg as he braces himself to stay upright. A car's acceleration out of a corner depends on the weight on the two rear tyres, so an acceleration force can be applied. The limiting factor here is the weight that's left on the inside rear tyre, which has been unloaded by the weight transfer to the outer tyre. For the car to handle correctly around the corner, the suspension engineer needs to set up the suspension to get a correct balance between the weight transferred on the front of the car compared to the weight transferred on the rear. He's able to do this by altering such things as the roll centres and suspension stiffness at either end of the car. Again, we won't go into this, but this is how it's done. Because the mid-engine car starts with less weight on the front outside tyre, the suspension engineer must bias more weight transfer to the front of the car. This in turn means that there's less weight transfer at the rear of the car, and of course, less unloading of the rear inner tyre and more acceleration potential. So the mid-engine car's advantage in straight line acceleration becomes even more advantageous in out of corner acceleration. The power can be applied earlier and harder than can be done in the front engine car. This out of corner acceleration, particularly in a racing situation, is a huge performance advantage in favour of a mid-engine car. Yes, I know the physics is difficult to understand. As a suggestion, if you want to follow the logic, you should pause the video at each slide to take it in. If you don't need to follow it, that's fine. I'll give you the summary now. The mid-engine car will accelerate harder than the front-engine car out of a turn because it won't unload the inside rear tyre as much as the front-engine car, allowing for more acceleration. This will be an even more pronounced advantage than it has in a straight line acceleration. My point number three is a mid-engine car will change direction easier than a front-engine car. You'll be pleased to hear this one should be simpler for you to understand than point number two. It relates to the resistance of an object, in this case a car, to change direction when it's travelling in a straight line. This resistance to changing direction or rotating the car, as they say in F1 circles, is called its rotational inertia. And what we know from the laws of physics is the force required to change the rotation of an object is dependent on the location of the mass in that object. The further away the mass is from the centre of rotation, the more difficult it is to rotate that object. Here's an example. Let's put a weight on the end of a piece of string. The longer the piece of string, the more effort it takes to swing it around. Notice how I can rotate the weight much faster when the string is shorter. And here's something else you can try to illustrate rotational inertia. Take a length of rod and tape a Coke can on each end of it. Rock it back and forth by rotating your wrist. Now move the cans in together as close as possible to your grip and try it again. You'll find the difference is quite astonishing. When the weight is near the centre of rotation, it's so much easier to rotate. That's because it has a lower rotational inertia. If you hadn't already guessed it, this is the situation we have with a mid-engine car. The major weights in a mid-engine car, in other words the engine, transmission, diff and even the driver, are all gathered close together and very close to the position of the centre of gravity about which the car will rotate. 
This is what we get with the C8. The C7, in contrast, has achieved its 50-50 weight distribution by balancing the front engine, which sits just behind the line of the front axle, with a rear-mounted transmission sitting just in front of the diff, and even a fairly much rear-mounted driver. For the C7, it's the Coke cans mounted towards the ends of the rod, while the C8 is like the Coke cans mounted together. The C8 rotates or changes direction easier because it has a lower rotational inertia. So summing up, the mid-engine car will change direction much easier than a front-engine car because the weight of the car is concentrated in a much tighter configuration at the centre of gravity than a front-engine car. Now there's also a fourth important benefit that comes with a mid-engine car, and that's improved braking. I'm adding it here for the sake of completeness, but I'm not going to go into it because it needs its own video. The interesting point is, if we use the formula we started with in point one, I'm afraid we'd have to conclude that there is no advantage with changing the weight distribution. We need to go deeper into the real world and explain why that formula is only partially correct. But that's something for another day. In one of GM's videos, Tadge talks about the feel of driving the C8. You come into corner, you hard brake, you whip the wheel around, it turns on a dime, and then you can get right on the gas, and it's just so easy to drive. I think that describes exactly all the things we've just been talking about. Just think about it. So now you know why a mid-engine car has more performance potential than a front-engine car. I hope you understood my presentation. I'm pretty sure you would have been able to understand my simplified summaries at least. So do you agree that GM made the right move to ensure the continued improvement in Corvette? Let me know your view in the comments section below. Well that's it for today. As always, if you liked the video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to easily find my videos among the thousands released each week, press the subscribe button. Ringing the bell will also get you a notification of each new video. But for now, happy vetting, and I hope to see you again real soon.